Welcome to Oral Hygiene. It's the podcast where we look at educational films, caught experimental films, and interesting documentaries. Uh, today, we'll be looking at the latter of those uh, topics. This is Matt, and with us today is Dr. Rick Strassman. Um, he did some of the first psychedelic drug like um, you know, scientific research in 20 years. Uh, he wrote a book, DMT, The Spirit Molecule, which we'll be talking about today. And of course, that dovetails into the documentary made about 10 years ago that also features on the book, which is something, of course, you can see on YouTube or whatever. So uh, hello, Rick. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Matthew. Thanks. But um, actually, I'll start where I usually I make the guests sort of give me like a short synopsis, but I, I feel like that's a little pointless in this case. So I'll, I'll actually tell you how I came to your book and the movie originally. Um, I, I've been living in Japan for 10 years. I haven't been outside of the borders for actually more than 10 years. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, of course, Japan, any thing that's not legal is completely off the table so about 2016 i was like oh, i wonder if i can you know work on my own mind to do that learning that oh there's dmt in your head how do we get that out which in the end turned out to uh, be a meditation practice which is probably better in the long run but uh i started started my journey with oh there's there's dmt in your head and uh got into reading the book and watching the documentary at the time and um but Rick, how did you originally come to um, focusing on DMT as your research um, focus? Um, well, my general interest was to look for the biology of spiritual experience. Um, I was wondering if there were some compound in the brain that was elevated uh, in spiritual experiences or any extreme uh, states of consciousness uh, near death, um, even psychosis, dreams, those kinds of uh, unusual naturally occurring states. Um, and I thought there must be some corresponding biological mechanisms at work in those states. Um, I started off looking at the pineal gland and melatonin in the 1980s because there wasn't much known about the human effects of melatonin at that time. Um, but it turned out that uh, melatonin was only sedating. Um, so. Um, in the meantime, I learned about DMT, which is extremely psychedelic, um, occurs in the human body, and uh, had been studied in previous experiments. So uh, there was a fair bit you know, known about it. Uh, so uh, our, our study was actually the first new American clinical research with um, psychedelics in over 20 years. Uh, it you know, preceded all the Hopkins work by 10, 11 years or so. Um, you know, so I chose DMT uh, as a you know, drug to reopen American research. Um, but at the same time, I was uh, interested in whether it uh, you know, duplicated or at least um, you know, caused some of the uh, things which occur in in uh, you know, naturally occurring altered states. If, for example, giving DMT mimicked certain features of the near-death experience, then one can make an argument that naturally occurring DMT you know, made in the brain was mediating those effects of the near-death state. Um, getting into that research, I know you have a whole, well, basically two chapters on the uphill battle of uh, making that happen in your book, um, I don't know, to the layman, we're, we're just, we tend to think, oh, well, Timothy Leary got high on his own supply and screwed it up for everyone. So um, I, I did find that journey uh, interesting, if you could say a few words about that. Well, it was the first new study in the US in a really long time. Um, and it was the first study that was proposed you know, since the uh, scheduling of all you know, psychedelics into the most restrictive legal category, Schedule One, um, and so I had to develop a entirely new regulatory strategy, uh, which involved getting the Drug Enforcement Agency and the Food and Drug Administration to cooperate, you know, to communicate with each other, to collaborate, to help me out, uh, because it required 
you know, both the approval of DEA, the Schedule One you know, permit, and it also required the permission of the FDA to give the drug you know, safely and to make certain it was pure, sterile, uh, the right uh, concentrations, those kinds of things. Uh, so that's what took you know two years. I couldn't give the drug until I had permission to possess it, but I couldn't you know, possess it until I had permission to give it. So uh, it was pretty crazy. Um, and uh, you know, it took a couple of years of once a week, twice a week, three times a week, phone calls and you know, faxes to Washington, DC. Uh, but you know, finally, November, 1990, uh, well, actually more than two years, I submitted the protocol in September, 88, and then you know, got permission in November, 1990. It sounds like you worked out sort of a Mobius strip of red tape there. So <laughs> congrats to that. Of course. Uh, it was quite helpful, you know, because all of the you know, subsequent American research has, you know, followed that you know, protocol. Um, you know, once our study ended, um, the University of, of Arizona studied psilocybin and OCD, and I helped them walk through the process. Uh, University of Miami studied Ibogaine, and I helped them. Uh, you know, work with DEA and FDA, and the Hopkins studies. Uh, I uh, you know, helped them out. Uh, you know, provided my grant, all the you know, paperwork with FDA and the DEA. You know, so um, yeah, it's a uh, your protocol. You know, that's really held up well, and uh, was responsible for uh, you know getting American research off the ground again. I'll probably keep alluding that the um, documentary, while very good, to me, it's sort of a, um, a teaser for the book. Uh, the book's sort of where, you know, just the amount of information is interesting there. And a few things that really hit me, uh, typically reading a book like that, it talks about the studies and it, it might even mention a few names, but it doesn't really get into people. It's like 10 people responded this way, 15 responded this way. And a couple elements in your book I found really interesting is uh, sort of the case studies you go through are similar to, they reminded me a little bit of the, uh, the Michael Newton live between live books a little bit, where we actually get into who these people are and something that was in your book that wasn't um, even in something like that was just talking about the, the environment around the room where you'd be doing the experiments, you know, like if a garbage truck came by, that's kind of an issue if someone is, uh, you know, two minutes uh, into the drug. So, um, where did, where did that focus in the book come from? I found it very interesting. Yeah, it was a pretty grim environment. You know, the garbage uh, truck would come by the trash compactor, which you know, had some really bad gears and it was responsible for the whole hospital, a university hospital. And it would just shriek. And uh, UNM is close to Kirtland Air Force Base, uh, a very you know, busy Air Force Base. And there's jet you know, fighters flying over the hospital on a regular schedule. Um, yeah, you know, so our studies occurred on a clinical research uh, you know, center uh, of University of New Mexico you know, uh, Hospital. Um, and it was also an experimental cancer chemotherapy ward. You know, so there were dying patients just, you know, down the hall uh, being treated with experimental chemotherapy. You know, so their room um, itself, you know, you can imagine, you know, linoleum floors and white walls and oxygen and the suction apparatus sticking out, you know, behind the bed. Uh, and we, uh, you know, really confined the volunteers. They had, you know, two IVs in place, a rectal probe to monitor their temperature, a blood pressure cuff. You know, so they basically couldn't move and they were in a really inhospitable environment. And you would think, you know, that is a recipe for disaster. Uh, but on the contrary, um, people were, you know, you know, once they got used to the whole scene, uh, they felt uh, safe. Uh, you know, they knew that, you know, DMT would, you know, take them out of their body. It would be very intense. Uh, and uh, one of the common themes of the experience of leaving your body like that is the sensation of dying. You know, that's a you know, common first you know, thought that crosses your mind after you leave your body after a big DMT injection. You know, so in a way, it was um, you know, reassuring 
you know, that if anything happened to them, any blood pressure problems, any cardiac arrest, any, you know, horrible things, uh, there'd be a code team just, you know, down the hall on them ready to respond. And one of the, you know, uh, one of the you know, things which will you know, cause a bad trip um, is you know, to resist the effects as they come on. And by the time they got the drug, they had already given up any resistance. Uh, it was a case of, okay, I'm pinned to this bed, I can't move. I'm in your hands, I trust you. you know, this is going to work out well. You know, so by the time we gave the drug, they were feeling pretty uh, well secured, you know, situated. They had let go uh, of any control over the you know, situation, and it actually, you know, turned out to be a helpful thing. On the contrary, with a longer-acting drug like psilocybin, six, eight hours, that kind of environment was, you know, really oppressive and caused, uh, you know, problems. You know, but for the DMT study, uh, where the drug starts working in a couple of minutes and it's out of your system uh, within a half hour, uh, you know, you know, the ward could quiet down. I asked the nurses you know, to turn off the PA system for a half hour, uh, and I would, you know, try to catch a, a you know, quiet, you know, window uh, on the ward. Um, you know, so you, for half hour, it, it was fine. It was, it was okay. You know, that kind of environment. Um, I, I understand that you've been pretty deep into Zen Buddhism as well. I'm, I'm coming to you from Nagano, Japan. So I'm not far from Zen Koji, which is the, uh, the home of Zen Buddhism. And I was just curious, like through, uh, meditation or anything, is there anything similar that you heard? from your volunteers that, you know, a person really can just with nothing achieve some of these. Of course, not a, you know, we've gone too far, reality has just broken down state, but I'm curious personally if you've made any uh, inroads there. Yeah, yeah, well, that's a key question. Uh, yeah, but before my answer, is that, you know, temple that you mentioned, is it the one established by Dogen? Um, I, I think so. Uh, the The main thing that it has going for it now is that it's one of the few temples in Japan that actually has a priestess running the the place. I see. But it, it is quite old. It's been yeah. Um, most of my recently, I just on a work break, just walk around it or or you know sit down and uh, do a quick meditation there. So I've. Um, it's interesting. There's a lot of little temples around Japan, and my favorite place to work. I. I I teach English or most, most of my classes are at school in the suburbs and I prefer that to the city because I know where all the temples are and I kind of like it's like I've almost worked out a personality so one day I want to go to this temple another day this temple you know I, I'm not I'm not having a full-on psychedelic experience but sometimes I'll lose a little time and space and be like oh god oh god is it five hours later if I missed a class and, and I haven't because I have a count going and all that so mm -hmm. uh, it, but yeah it, it, it is a place Stogan came through yeah yeah, well, because, you know, Dogen studied it in, in China. He couldn't find any good Buddhism teachers in Japan. So he went to China and trained there and then came over and established a temple, which is called Eheji. And his number one disciple, Keizan, then, you know, founded Sojiji. Um, and uh, my teacher trained at Sojiji, um, an English woman who spent years in Japan, became a priest, a monk, a Roshi, um, and you know, moved to Northern California, and I studied under the supervision of her temple. Um, yeah, you know, so I studied and you know, practiced you know Zen Buddhism for uh, uh, you know many years before beginning my DMT study, and I was uh, under the impression, or had hoped, or believed that giving a big enough dose of DMT would you know, duplicate a Kensho, a Zen enlightenment experience, the, you know, formless state, uh, oneness, emptiness, shunyata, um, you know, because, you know, that was, you know, the scaffolding, the spiritual scaffolding that I was standing on when doing my study. Um, I, I'd been interested, you know, I, I started studying Buddhism when I was 20 or so in college and then started to train, you know, four years later. Um, 1974 when I was 22. 
you know, so if I had started or if I would studied the Tibetan, you know, Buddhist, you know, tradition, for example, which is much more psychedelic, uh, or it's you know, much more DMT like, or it, it includes states and practices which are I'm involved with, you know, DMT like you know, phenomena, um, you know, beings and interacting and space travel and things like that. You know, but the Zen tradition, especially the one I was uh, trained in, uh, was oriented towards emptiness, towards nirvana, kensho, satori, shunyata. So, you know, I expected those kinds of experiences in my volunteers given enough DMT. And most of the volunteers were practicing some meditation technique and also were expecting that kind of uh, an effect. Um, but only one of the volunteers had that kind of experience, and it was uh, you know, a physician who in college had been a religious studies major and had been you know, working up to an enlightenment experience for the intervening you know, 20, 20 plus years. Um, everybody else's experiences, especially on the high doses, were quite interactive, you know, full of content, time and space continued. Um, the personality was maintained, there was a lot of information. Um, you know, so it was in a way the complete opposite of the Kensho experience that both I and the volunteers had expected. You know, but along the lines of are you increasing your DMT levels when you meditate? Well, it, you know, depends. It depends on, you know, what happens when you meditate. Is it DMT-like? And to the extent, that, you know, that it is DMT-like, then it makes sense that naturally occurring DMT may be involved. Yeah, but we are only now just beginning to understand the mechanics, you know, the DMT you know, synthesizing system in the brain. Uh, you know, the enzymes were just discovered. It was determined that there is a lot of DMT in the mammalian brain. But what turns it on, what turns it off? Are there states where more DMT is released or less? conditions, syndromes, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, that hasn't been worked out yet. Uh, you know, people are using psychedelics to improve their meditation because of the you know, seeming overlap between at least you know, low doses of you know, psychedelics and uh, you know, Buddhist you know, meditation, you know, which isn't especially psychedelic meditation like Vipassana, Zazen. Um, the Tibetan tradition, you know, might you know, benefit from you know, higher doses, for example, you know, um, be, you know, because of their emphasis on uh, you know, visualizations. But um, you know, lower doses uh, are being used in vipassana retreats, and there was a paper came out a year or two ago uh, indicating that if you take a little bit of you know, psilocybin before a mindfulness retreat, that you're you know, that your meditation is better. Um, you attain to more, you know, rarefied, you know, desired states. Um, you know, so it's being done. It's been done for some time, but now it's being you know, published about as well. Yeah, you're mentioning the, the Zen Buddhism and the Tibetan thing. And I was like, oh, it's night and day. And I was thinking, well, that's basically how I go about things. If I do a meditation a day, I'm looking for that, you know, that formless state. Um, early when I earlier on, I'd see, you know, little faces come in and look in. And that's the thing you want to ignore in that case. You, you don't really want that. Whereas if I do wake up at five in the morning, that would be the more DMT maybe based um, Tibetan thing, because that's where, you know, the, the dream work, I guess it's like dream yoga is uh, right. one of the things they call it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Right. Uh, so um, it depends on what your practice is, what you're you know, seeking uh, in your, your meditative you know, practice. Uh, yeah, it, it was interesting. Um, when I was a medical student, I was able to swing an elective in community in, in uh, you know, community health and spent about you know, six weeks studying with a you know, Tibetan Lama. Um, and uh, those were pretty psychedelic, you know, practices, way different than, you know, Zazen, just, you know, simple sitting in Zen. Well, you know, it isn't a simple sitting, you know, but it's a you know, very simple technique. And, you know, the results are not, you know, they're not complicated. Uh, 
as opposed to um, the Tibetan practices, which are complicated practices and result in complicated states. So, uh, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they are night and day. I suppose they're intended to attain to the same result, which is, I guess, an enlightened way of looking at life. But uh, you know, they seem pretty different to me. Yeah, I would say for anyone you're know, trying to now, and I'm at best, I would say I'm like an intermediate meditator. Um, <laughs> I think I think I'm past the beginner stage, but yeah, uh, the, you know, doing a Zen meditation, you'll, you'll start to get results pretty quickly. Whereas these morning things, I mean, it's ta you, one, you got to remember, you got to have the intention, the focus, all that. And it takes years, you know, the first couple of years of trying that, I, I got to get a real hit, maybe like once a year, I think I'm up to about once a month now. So, but it's, you know, when, when something works there, it's, it's pretty mind blowing. Uh, again, that might be a little closer to a DMT experience. Uh, the one that really got me is sort of the rush um, in that method I just found. And I think I even mentioned this in the last podcast, even though we were talking about Jimi Hendrix, but just having floating images and one of those images kind of coalescing um, a, a smooth ride, not being blasted at warp speed through through the cosmos, as I guess a lot of your volunteers reported. Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, one of our volunteers was a uh, you know, former Zen monk. And uh, even though he didn't you know, have a Kensho at the monastery, he, you know, derobed, uh, you know, lived a lay life after that. And he went to a Vipassana retreat and had a Kensho. And it, it, it was, you know, certified you know, by the teacher there, um, like an enlightenment experience. You know, so I was you know, quite interested in you know, his response to DMT, you know, would it be, you know, like, is it like your meditation? Is it like your Kensho? Um, so, you know, he was a bit hard to figure in a way, uh, kind of a strong silent type. Uh, so it was really hard to know what was going on. But um, the main thing, yeah, well, you know, there are two things about you know, his response. You know, one was, uh, he was very keen on keeping control. He wanted to see if at the peak of the effect, he could you know, move his arm, move his legs, you know, sit up, uh, you know, those kinds of willful maneuvers. And, um, you know, and also he didn't like it that much uh, compared to his Kensho or, you know, the, you know, the emotional valence was quite different. Uh, he thought that the DMT was a bit confusing as, as opposed to the Kensho, which was, you know, clarifying enlightenment. Um, so he wasn't that fond of the state itself. He compared one not, you know, favorably to the other. Um, so that's about all I could, you know, tell you, but still, uh, it was an interesting comparison in the same person. Yeah, something I've sort of started to think more and more the past few years is a, a lot of psychedelic substances is sort of uh, trying to kick the door down into, you know, other states. Um, that's where the, the Zen stuff or the Tibetans, they worked out the system where they're, you know, trying to open the door properly. Well, you know, some people say, and I think including the Dalai Lama, and um, oh gosh, there's a Indian, no, there's a you know, Chinese translator from way, way long ago who translated Indian sutras, Buddhist you know, sutras. And he wrote a book about the you know, same topic you know, that the Dalai Lama did, you know, which is this, uh, it's, it's about this you know, thing called uh, bodhicitta, you know, bodhicitta. Um, and you can look it up on Wikipedia and they go on and on and on about it, you know, but, um, you know, put you know, simply, it's, it's the, the first flash of enlightenment, the first flash that things can be different than they are, that, you know, things are, you know, different than they are, you know, that it is possible to uh, view the world through a completely different lens, uh, completely different, even though it's the you know, same world. Uh, and that's called bodhicitta, and it's the first step towards enlightenment. It makes you want to study Buddhism 
it makes you want to attain enlightenment. You know, so without, you know, bodhicitta, there's nothing. You know, there's no, you know, there's no Buddhist practice um, without, you know, bodhicitta. And uh, when you're talking about, you know, breaking down the door, uh, you could also, you know, looking at it as, uh, you know, prying open the window. Uh, it's the first view out of our cage. Um, and uh, it occurs incredibly often on a big, you know, dose of a, a psychedelic. Um, and um, I verified that in an informal survey that I did when I uh, was visiting or living at the monastery, you know, which is, you know, to ask as many monks as I could, you know, how frequently or, you know, did they take LSD you know, before they became a monk? And pretty much all of them said yes. And I, you know, then, you know, followed up with, well, how important was your LSD experience to becoming a monk? And they all said, without LSD, I wouldn't be a monk. You know, so it's the same, you know, kind of thing that you're talking about. Um, it breaks down the door, it kind of, you know, shows you what, you know, what is possible. You know, but then if you want to, you know, live in that state or a state that resembles what was, you know, shown to you on LSD, uh, you know, then it takes the long, hard plodding, you know, hour by hour, day by day, uh, you know, practice. Uh, and if, you know, the practice, you know, revolves around meditation, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, the way you're trying to clarify your mind enough to be able to, you know, live in an enlightened state more of the time. I guess that's uh, also nicely encapsulated with uh, Alan Watts's quote with, uh, you know, once you get the message, hang up the phone. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. And, you know, a lot of people just do psychedelics to return to that state, you know, rather than using that state as a springboard to develop a real, you know, daily lifelong practice. Um, you, you know, that's one of the you know, drawbacks of the, of the mystical experience school of, you know, psychedelics, uh, because there's no, you know, text, no verbal, you know, record of the verbal information, which is conveyed in the different kind of state, which I call the interactive relational one, you know, like the DMT state is, you know, full of information, um, as opposed to shunyata, which is empty of pretty much everything. Um, you know, so if uh, you have got a verbal, you know, like if you have a written, uh, you know, record of the verbal content of those states in a text, for example, if you have questions, if you need help, you need guidance, you could return to that text. Uh, but if you're in a, the, uh, if you're in the mystical experience, you know, wordless you know, mindset, um, especially if that's your model for tripping, uh, you know, then you're kind of, you know, forced to, you know, trip again, you know, get back into that state and you'll get the answer. Uh, you know, so it's a bit, I think, you know, higher risk or more prone to abuse. Like if you, you know, need to trip to get answers, as opposed to once you've tripped, you can, you know, find, you know, references that are, in text form that you could you know turn to when questions arise well yeah it's like the guy that can't find his car keys unless he smokes a joint first <laughs> right right that's going to lead to a lot of marijuana use <laughs> right <laughs> um, and a lot of lost keys too yes <laughs> uh one of my regular co-hosts on this show he's he's been uh obsessing over the ndes recently and I, I know that's a connection that you were looking for with some of the uh, dmt experiences can you talk a little bit about that yeah um well um you know the near-death experience is an extreme alteration of consciousness uh that occurs on its own you know you don't give you know it it, it isn't the effect of you know giving drugs uh, like you're in a car accident, you have a your cardiac arrest, um, you have an NDE. And uh, I had speculated, you know, before my study, you know, that there might be DMT released in the brain or the pineal gland at the time of death. And to the extent that was the case, DMT was mediating the DMT-like effects or uh, 
you know, characteristics, attributes of the NDE. You know, so if you're out of body in an NDE and, you know, DMT puts you out of body, you know, it you know, could be, you know, that the out of body experience of an NDE is the result of elevated brain levels of DMT that occur endogenously or on their own. You know, so I was interested in comparing uh, the DMT uh, effect with the classic NDE. Uh, and uh, it's interesting, as I mentioned earlier, the only mystical experience, enlightenment experience that occurred in my study was in a volunteer um, who was a religious studies major and had always wanted a mystical enlightenment experience. And, you know, gee whiz, he's the only guy out of, you know, five dozen volunteers that had that kind of experience. Well, it is a you know, similar case with the one NDE or the one, you know, classic NDE, uh, which occurred in our study. Uh, it was a nurse with a long standing interest in NDEs who had been studying them, had been reading all the books, listening to interviews, and was, you know, hoping to have an NDE in our study. And she did. Uh, so, you know, I think one of the you know, take home lessons of you know, my research, you know, where I didn't tell people what kind of trip to have or give them a goal. I just wanted them to have their own trip. Um, and their own trip is their own trip. It's uh, dependent on what they bring to the study. Uh, the enlightenment experience occurred in a guy that always wanted an enlightenment state, the near death experience or you know, NDE you know, like experience only occurred in the one patient with a long standing interest in uh, those, those, those kinds of experiences. Um, but you know, that being said, uh, you know, there is DMT in the brain uh, and you know, there are at least reported overlaps between the NDE and the DMT experience. And in fact, uh, Chris Timmerman at Imperial College in, um, in London a few years ago, you know, gave NDE questionnaires to people who had smoked DMT and you know, gave the same questionnaire to another group of individuals who had had spontaneous NDEs. And there was quite a strong overlap, or you know, quite a you know, pronounced overlap in the um, you know, symptoms. Um, and so a few years ago, 2019, there was a study came out of Ann Arbor, University of Michigan, uh, Jimo Borjigan and John Dean. Uh, and they found that uh, brain levels of DMT increase quite a bit, three to five times in the you know, dying animal, you know, the dying rodent. If you, you know, cause a heart attack in a, um, in a rodent, you know, it's kind of grim you know, research, but still it's been done. Um, you know, if, if you kill an animal um, in that controlled manner, uh, you can you know, measure DMT levels in the brain. And they increase quite a bit. And they also increase particularly in the visual cortex, uh, which is interesting because, uh, you know, the NDE is quite visual, you know, so you know, perhaps, you know, DMT is involved in, it's obviously not the only compound uh, that's going, you know, crazy uh, at the time of death, you know, but it, it seems to go up. So it's among you know, many you know, possible compounds that are responsible or you know, mediate certain features of the NDE. Uh, you know, DMT is also what, what is called neuroprotective of brain tissue when you know, the brain is exposed to low oxygen levels. It you know, prevents the you know, death of nerve cells in conditions of low oxygen. You know, so DMT is neuroprotective in conditions of low brain oxygen. Um, and it also you know, seems you know, to reduce on the size of strokes in experimental animals. And also in cre it, it also speeds up recovery uh, from strokes if you give you know, DMT early on in you know, the course of animal experiments. Um, and um, you know, there are some studies which are coming out of UC Davis um, well, the, you know, the neuroprotective uh, studies came out of Hungary uh, and the, uh, you know, more, you know, precision oriented, you know, mechanistic uh, studies of the way DMT is neuroprotective um, are coming out of UC Davis. 
And those studies indicate that you know, DMT increases neurogenesis. Uh, in other words, new brain cells. And it also stimulates what's called neuroplasticity, uh, which is the complexity of connections between nerve cells. You know, so it you know, seems as if you know, DMT is some kind of brain food or brain you know, fertilizer, uh, which is really cranked up uh, in conditions of duress, you know, brain duress. You know, so the, the, the you know, concentrations of DMT in the rodent brain are quite high, comparable to serotonin. You know, so there could be a DMT neurotransmitter system uh, in the brain. And you know, God only knows what you know, that would be responsible for. It uh, you know, could be you know, kicked into high gear in the dying animal. Um, it you know, may be involved in you know, mediating our you know, sense of reality, you know, because the hallmark of a DMT effect is the you know, sense that what you're you know, witnessing is more real than real. And if there's a DMT neurotransmitter system in your brain, you know, that could be, you know, what it's responsible for, you know, but at, you know, the very least it's a neuroprotective compound that stimulates, you know, nerve growth and, you know, nerve connections. And uh, you know, that's going to be exploited, you know, therapeutically in clinical, you know, trials, which are ongoing now, you know, to the extent that, you know, DMT is involved in the NDE and that, DMT increases in the dying state. It you know, suggests um, that taking DMT before you die would be a dry run, you know, so to speak. Uh, you'd be entering a comparable brain state or a state that your, your brain is in uh, as you're dying, you know, before you die. Um, so you know, that's a therapeutic or a spiritual or any combination thereof. Uh, potential application of DMT in light of its possible involvement in the dying state. Having just read the last chapter of the book, I was like, oh, well, okay, it's good. Some of these uh, research ideas have been, have been done. I remember the rodents were mentioned in there as a hypothetical at the time. And um, it's quite, yeah, it, it is quite gratifying to, you know, see you know, some of those, uh, you know, theories put to the test and, uh, you know, coming out to be, uh, you know, valid ideas. Um, the book itself kind of mentions, it, it's a very interesting time, but these people's, the volunteers' lives generally haven't changed from the experience. Uh, the idea of maybe being it's not completely therapeutic. Uh, the 2010 documentary had a few of these people on film, at least looking at it nostalgically. Um, have there been any you know, 30 year later, long term effects that are of note, uh, if you've been in touch with any of them? Yeah, I've stayed in contact with some. Um, you know, it's important to keep in mind our study was a psychopharmacology you know, dose response study in normal volunteers who were experienced uh, you know, psychedelic users. And instead of, you know, uh, you know 10 to 12 hours of your know, preparatory you know, psychotherapy, education, indoctrination about this is going to help your depression. This is going to give you a mystical experience. This is going to help you stop drinking. This will help you stop being OCD. You know, you know, there was none of that. It was, here's the drug. It's really fast. It's over quickly. You may think you've died, but don't worry. We've got it covered. And in the meantime, just have your own trip. You know, so there you know, wasn't a therapeutic outcome. These weren't patients and there was no goal other than to really keep your eyes open in that state and report you know, back uh, as much as you could remember. So in that case, um, well, you, well, you know, everybody's got things that they're working on. Everybody has got um, problems, you know, so, you know, people were able to work things out, you know, psychologically, but it was completely dependent on what they were working on. Uh, one guy changed his specialty from your know, family your practice to get a, uh, you know, some extra you know, training in OBGYN as a result of his you know, DMT experience. You know, somebody else you know, got a facelift uh, after his big you know, DMT dose. I guess he wanted to look younger or didn't want to feel as old uh, or you know experience some existential uh, confrontation with you know with old age and death. Um, you know, so it, you know, wasn't across the board an antidepressant effect or an anti-anxiety effect or, you know, this or that. It was, 
dependent on who the person was and what they were bringing to the study. You know, but the one thing uh, which stuck with people was the enormity of the experience. It was the benchmark of all benchmarks for a you know, psychedelic experience. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, that was indelibly embedded in their mind, you know, never to be forgotten. Uh, you know, we, you know, when uh, uh, you know, volunteers would come out of their first big, you know, DMT, uh, you know, session, you know, we would you know, talk about, you know, how they felt marked, marked for life after, the, you know, that experience. You know, so it, uh, you know, provided, a, a, or it established a new standard of altered consciousness, but, uh, you know, over the long run, therapeutic benefit or psychological benefit, it completely depended. Um, I'm going to come at you with a little bit of a left field question. Uh, some of the volunteers mentioned, of course, there's the the hum that accompanies entering that kind of state, but also mentions of kind of like overpowering metallic clanging sounds sometimes or the end of a bell sound. And um, I know there's uh, because I recently I haven't had so much of an issue, but in the past I've had what they uh interestingly called like exploding head syndrome where you're just walking down the street and suddenly there's a like in the you know just like from the center of your head and I, I wonder if there is a connection there or, or if you've even heard of this <laughs> yeah yeah the exploding head syndrome I yeah yeah I've heard of it I've looked into it a bit I've gotten some emails from people who suffer from it um <clears throat> you know it could be DMT but I mean you you want uh you want to be careful you know that you're not uh, implicating you know, DMT in every weird thing that happens to anyone. Um, the uh, exploding head you know, syndrome isn't quite what uh, the volunteers would describe as the you know, sound uh, which occurred at uh, you know, the onset of the experience. Um, it, it was a you know, building you know, high pitched kind of a sound. Uh, and uh, it would uh, <clears throat> You know, climax at the you know dissociation of the mind from the body, you know. So it would build and build and build, you know, during the rush, which was maybe, you know, sixty seconds, you know, ninety seconds or so, and it would end uh, once you you know disembodied yourself. And the state itself was usually rather silent. Uh, it was extremely visual, but it wasn't really all that auditory. Um, you know that wasn't you know you know that wasn't the case across the board you know some you know people you know heard music or you know voices but uh you know relative to, you know to the visual content you know the auditory in the state itself uh was much less yeah in the case of that i would uh, obviously it could be like an auditory thing but just when i was reading i was like oh i've, I've had that happen a few times and i it, but being a different sound obviously uh sketches that out we're getting a little low on the time that we were talking about. So um, just real yeah. quick, I, I know you've been doing lots of interesting work. There's um, DMP and the Soul of Prophecy from a, a, a few years ago. There, uh, You wrote a novel, I believe, two years ago. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you're up to now? Yeah. Um, well, the 2014 book on prophetic states and DMT was my foray into the world of the Hebrew Bible and the prophetic experience. And in it, I propose that you know, DMT's effects are more uh, accurately modeled by the prophetic state in the Bible than the enlightenment state in Buddhism. And uh, it's a convoluted argument, but I think I do a pretty good job of you know, laying out my points. Yes, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a slow go uh, because first of all, you need to kind of get into the idea that the Hebrew Bible is worth looking at. Uh, for and for you know lots of you know secular you know Westerners that's quite a stretch. Um, you know the other book came out in 2019 called Joseph Levy Escapes Death and uh, it's what's called an autobiographical novel. Uh, my character goes through a year of of you know poor health uh, and you know poor medical care in a small southwest you know town. Um, yeah, you know so it's an account of that year. You know, being sick, recovering, uh, accidental overdose, you know, kind of, you know, tragic relationships, um, 
you know, perseverance, dreams, friends, staring out the window. Yeah, you know, so it's a bit of a, you know, it's it, it's, it's a shift, but still, I, I mean, it was a strange year for me going through that illness and recovery. And if I got through it, I swore I would write about it uh, because it was just too hard to believe. I mean, is this really happening? Went through in my mind a lot of that year. Um, yeah, and it was happening and I took notes and I thought it would be a, a fun story to tell. Um, it hasn't gotten much you know, traction um, because you know, self-published more or less with a small press in Berkeley, you know, uh, you know, no marketing is a pretty dark book. And it's completely, in a way, you know, different than you know DMT. I'm, uh, you know, the character or, you know, the uh, you know content anyway is extremely different. You know, but there is a connection. I, I mean, it's, you know, like you know, how spiritual can you be when you're that sick? Um, so I think they do you know tie in together. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I encourage people to, you know, check out that book. Well, you know, like on Amazon, you know, the ranking of my. DMT book is 15 to 20,000, let's say, you know, the prophecy book is between 200,000 to, you know, 400,000. Uh, you know, Joseph Levy is, escapes death is 1.1 million, 1.4 million in ranking, you know, so it isn't as popular as my nonfiction. No, well, at, at least it's still there. I have some friends that make movies and uh, Amazon has sort of been like yanking a lot of the independent stuff as they have their own original content, but I, I don't think that'll happen with the books. Uh, is Amazon the best place to look for these books? Well, you, you can order them, you know, through my, uh, you know, through my website, rickstrossman.com, uh, and I will sign and inscribe them. Uh, you know, but if you're, you know, but if you're overseas, um, you're probably just, you know, the local Amazon uh, distributor. Yeah, I'm I'm tied to my my iPad for all my reading needs now. <laughs> or Kindle, or, or Audible. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. I'm reading them on a on a Kindle. But uh, Rick, it's been fantastic talking to you today. Um, you know, maybe if they have another chance, I would like to get more into the Hebrew Bible stuff. But uh, as as time allowed, I only at best had time to to sk uh, skim over that one for this one. So. Well, sure. Yeah. You uh, you know, be in touch. Okay, thanks. And um, just to let you know, this will probably be up in about uh, a week and a half or two weeks and a half. So it'll be out for the masses for too long. Okay. And if you could uh, send me the link, I can post it on my sites. Yes, of course. I always do that. Okay. I'll have a, a good evening on your end, I guess. So. <laughs> well, thanks. And you too. It's a pleasure chatting. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, and now I'll just use that time to give my my quick own plug. This is Aura Hygiene Pod. We're at Twitter, we're at Facebook, all of that stuff. And um, you know, just keep in keep in mind if you want to have like a real trip, um, DMT would do it. But you can work it out with your own mind. So uh, that I don't know. I think ultimately that's probably the place to go.